गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन माई नेम इज दलित सोनी एंड यू आर वॉचिंग पॉलिटी दिस वीक बाय दृष्टि आई एस इन दिस सेशन विल बी डिस्कसिंग सर्टेन टॉपिक्स फ्रॉम द इंडियन पॉलिटी विच कैन बी इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर योर एग्जाम एंड दिस टॉपिक सम हाउ हैज बीन इन द न्यूज सो विल बी ट्राइंग टू टॉक अबाउट द स्टेटिक पार्ट ऑफ दिस टॉपिक सो लेट्स स्टार्ट इन टूडे सेशन विल बी डिस्कसिंग अबाउट फोर फाइव टॉपिक दिस टॉपिक्स आर प्रोसिक्यूटिंग सी एम और चीफ मिनिस्टर Recently, you must have heard that there was this issue which is going on in the Karnataka with respect to the prosecution of CM in Muda scam. Okay, so we'll be talking about the what are the legal provision with respect to that. We will not go into details of the scam, but we will go for uh, with res- uh, we will talk about the uh, legal aspects which are there with respect to prosecuting a chief minister. Okay, and chief minister being a public servant, we'll be talking with that respect. Okay, then. second is lateral entry recently you know that government has come up with the vacancies 45 vacancies or 45 posts with respect to the lateral entry but then uh, after certain uh, you can say criticism etc they have actually took back the advertisement okay but still we'll be looking at the concept of the lateral entry okay we'll see what are the positives and negatives attached to it then moving further what is extradition when we talk about the term extradition we will be talking uh, we will be discussing what is extradition other than that we'll see recently it was in news because of the former prime minister of bangladesh sheikh hasina she has actually uh, uh, took asylum in india and after that bangladesh uh, you know domestic uh, leaders are saying that she should be returned to uh, bangladesh and there with respect to that this extradition process is has been in the news and we'll be talking about the legal provisions related to that as well then moving further euthanasia in india when we talk about euthanasia we'll try to understand what is what is euthanasia what are the legal status of euthanasia in india there are different types one is active second is passive we'll be talking about that as well we'll be talking about the positives and negatives of the euthanasia as well then coming to the last one that is uniform civil code from the rampart of uh, red fort you can say our prime minister has talked certain things about the uniform civil code they, he has said that we are still we are still living under the communal courts or it's time that we should think about the uniform civil code so we'll be talking about the uniform civil code as well okay so let's start we'll start with the first one that is power of governor and the tussle between the cm and the governor and when we are talking about this muda scam with respect to that we'll be looking at the power of governor with respect to the prosecution of chief minister okay so as i told you there was this scam muda scam was related to some kind of land which has been uh, you know uh, in question and this land uh, when we are talking about the compensatory land which was provided that was uh, a little bit of having a value which is higher than the market value that is nearly there was a scam of nearly 4000 crores okay so that is why this muda scam was there in news and in that you know chief minister's name was also there considering that uh, we'll be talking about the prosecution of chief minister over here now legal provisions if we talk about the prosecution of a public servant because cm is also a public servant okay and since it is a case of corruption so we also have a prevention of corruption act 1988 okay and as per the provisions of that particular act there are uh, you know certain sections which are given and they are talking about some legal provisions section 17a is saying that no investigation by a police officer into any offence committed by the public servant can occur without prior sanctions from the proper authority okay so basically 17a is saying that whenever there is a you can say allegation with respect to the corruption on a public servant then you should have a prior sanctions from the you can say authority okay and here in this case when we are talking about the cm the authority is the governor of the state okay so that is about the section uh, uh, section 70 a here you can say there is no investigation even a investigation cannot initiate on a public servant without a sanction okay now coming to the next art, uh, section that is basically section 19 of the prevention of corruption act 1988 they are saying that no prosecution of public servant can proceed without the permission of the governor initially only the governor sanction for the init- uh, investigation is required so here two things are there one is your investigation second is your prosecution okay so for the investigation or uh, you know uh, sanction of an authority is required and after that once the investigation is done and prima facie it was found that there was some kind of crime which has been committed or there is a case which is uh, uh, made for the corruption in that case you need to have a sanction of governor to prosecute the public servant okay 
so first thing is that for investigation you need a sanction that is given under 17a for prosecution also you need a sanction from the governor that is given under section 19 okay so that these are two different things here sanction for the prosecution if we talk about if sufficient evidence is found during the investigation a separate sanction is required to launch a formal prosecution okay so here uh, it is made clear that if there is a prima facie case so you have to take a separate sanction for the prosecution as well okay so these are some legal provisions with respect to the you can say prosecution of a public servant under prevention of corruption act okay that is why in the given case of the muda scam there was this sanction which was asked for and governor has given the sanction okay then coming to the prevention of corruption act 1988 we will be talking about the some salient feature we know that since the name itself says that it is about you know uh, some uh, you know activities we want to prevent and that is corruption and you know that when we are talking about corruption corruption there are various forms okay so if we talk about the salient feature of this act so there are certain definitions which has been given in that so such definitions include public duty public servant etc so they have made it uh, you can say there was certain uh, aspect of these pro, uh, definitions has been in, enhanced okay so they have made it broader or you can say that they have enlarged the scope of these definitions in the prevention of corruption act okay moving further it has shifted the burden of proof earlier when we talk about the issues with respect to corruption they were dealt by the crpc okay you know that we had this criminal procedure code and in that particular code we had the issues related to corruptions as well but the thing is the definition etc which are given over there that was not very uh, you know broad and that is why we have come up with another act okay and that act has enlarged the scope of the you can say definitions of the public servant public duties etc and in crpc the burden of proof was there on the prosecutor okay the person who is actually there to prove that this accused has committed a crime but when we are talking about the prevention of corruption act the burden of proof has shifted to the accused person that he has to prove that i have not been part of the any corrupt, uh, corruption or any kind of such activities okay so here we can say that the burden of proof has shifted on the accused over here okay so under prevention of corruption act the burden of proof is on the accused and not on the prosecutor okay moving further the provisions of the act clearly states that the investigation is to be made by an officer not below the rank of the deputy superintendent of police so below the rank of dsp no one can go for the investigation okay that is to ensure that there is a sanctity or there is a you can say unbiased in the investigation okay then moving further act covers corruption or the uh, acts related to corruption like bribe misappropriation of funds obtaining a pecuniary advantage processing assets uh, or possessing assets disproportionate to the income and like so basically they have increased the uh, scope of the definition over here they have included these terms such as bribe uh, misappropriation of funds obtaining a pecuniary advantage possessing assets which are disproportionate to your income all these are uh, you know uh, you can say covered under the prevention of corruption act as activities which are corrupt okay so that is about the salient feature of the prevention of corruption act okay so i hope that is clear now we have discussed that there are certain pro uh, procedure section 17 is there se uh, section 19 is there so these are related to sanctions uh, prior sanctions which we need for the prosecution and the investigation okay then we have talked about the prevention of corruption act we have talked about the salient feature of that now coming to the next topic that is related to your lateral entry okay now when we are talking about the lateral entry in the governance why this is necessary recently there was this uh, you can say notification by upsc that government has uh, uh, put forward 45 vacancies and that has to be fulfilled by the lateral entry okay after that there were certain issues which has been flagged and uh, a government has cited that there was issues related to the social justice and that is why they have taken back the notification and upsc has withdrawn the notification okay but for us it is important what is lateral entry from where it started and what are the positives and negatives okay now lateral entry means that whatever the process of appointment is there okay to bypass that and then we can directly make sure that certain people can come into the governance and that can be asset for the governance okay now how can be, they be assets because they have the prior experience in that particular field they have the exp, uh, expertise in that particular field okay now let's talk about the lateral entry we'll be looking at the definition in certain words here you can see lateral entry is needed because contemporary time is required highly skilled and the motivated individual at the helm of the administrative affairs 
without which public services delivery mechanism do not work smoothly here we are saying that since the times are very competitive okay we need to be very efficient and for that some skilled highly skilled and motivated individuals are required mostly it is considered that the when we are talking about the private sector or the corporate sector we know that these are most efficient sectors if we compare with the public sectors okay and that is why we are taking certain people from that arena and they can be you can say introduced into the public service and they can change the work culture over here that is the idea behind it okay now here you can see however the success of letter entry hinge entirely on the how the process is designed how you are taking the recruitments okay so that is about the letter entry now here you can see there are certain advantages to letter entry because obviously they have expertise so here you can see specialized knowledge bringing niche expertise or you can say that functional specialization functional specialization now the thing is these are the people who are the you can say best performer in their own field or they are having certain you know expertise and skill in that particular field and that is why they are being hired in the governance okay let's say there is a person from the you can say uh, it industry and when we are talking about the ministry that is we have information information and technology ministry or the methi we have in that uh, if we want someone to be there in that particular ministry we can hire or we can have a lateral entry from the industry itself okay so that is the idea behind the lateral entry over here now moving further filling the gap okay since an ies level cadre if you talk about so what happens is that it takes 15 to 17 years for a person to you know reach to a joint secretary level okay so because of which there is the shortage of is officers okay and that is why we can say that we can hire people from outside which are already having an expertise of 10 to 15 years in that particular arena okay then uh, work culture changes introduce value of efficiency and performance and reduce red tapism as i told you in the private sector there is some kind of efficiency is there in the private sector you will be seeing that there is less of red tapism so that can be introduced in the public sector as well if the you know individuals from that particular arena are introduced into it okay then participatory governance if we talk about the participatory governance or the you can say uh, involvement of the stakeholders from various uh, walks of life in the governance okay so since these people are from the industry or science or arts or sports okay so these can be uh, you know uh, part of the governance uh, that is why it is uh, it is an advantage that we will have a participatory governance okay these are certain advantages of lateral entry now let's talk about the what are the disadvantages or what are the argument against this lateral entry okay here you can see outsourcing expertise now we are saying that you should not go for permanent hires because there is a recruitment process by the less when we are talking about the joint secretary level or when we talk about the administration we have a you can say particular body upsc which is going for the administrative services examination and all so you don't have to go for the you can say permanent hires from the outside you can just outsource the work okay so here you can say you can say you can go for the outsourcing the expertise you can uh, you know invite them as a consultant etc and then they can do the same job over there okay so that is one argument which is there expertise can be accessed through the existing mechanism not just through the permanent hires okay second is cumbersome process now it is uh, you know difficulty in adopting to the bureaucracy and the network building within the limited time now when we are talking about the later entries these are basically contractual uh, you can say entries which are given okay or uh, you can say these appointments are contractual in nature so there is a limited period of time in that particular limited period of time a person has to accommodate to the work culture of the bureaucracy then you have to make contact as well over there okay and there should be an acceptance of that particular person which is coming from outside into that particular uh, you can say office so all these things are not possible in the limited period of time so ultimately whatever our objective is that might fail over here then moving further profit motive versus public service now this person is coming from the private sector or the corporate life when we are talking about the corporate sector or the private sector the aim or the goal is to achieve or the gain profit over there okay so when we are talking about the businesses etc the main motive is to earn profit now when it is coming to the governance the aim over here is public service so that person has to change the attitude from gaining profit to public service and that is not easy i say okay then moving further conflict of interest now this person is coming from the corporate and now he is in the ministry and that ministry is there to regulate the public uh, you can say private industry 
now somehow this person since he is on the contractual basis so there are high chances that he will be doing or he might be biased towards the industry or the stakes which he might have after he is you know getting out of the job okay so there can be a possible conflict of interest there what is conflict of interest we have discussed in our previous lecture so you can go through that okay so that is about the lateral entry these are the positive and the negative about the lateral entry recently we know that there was this advertisement and that has been withdrawn so you can just uh, know what is the concept of lateral entry when we talk about the introduction of this contract that was there earlier lateral entry was there earlier but formally it was introduced in 2018 it was introduced in 2018 on the recommendation of the niti ayog okay so that is there i hope that is clear as of now for lateral entry that must be enough for your examination okay now coming to the next article which is related to the extradition okay recently you know that because of the uh, violence activities which has happened in bangladesh there was this issues with respect to the reservation and ultimately the former uh, prime minister of bangladesh has to flee from bangladesh and she came to india now there are various fir which has been filed in bangladesh and it was said that since uh, these are the crime uh, you know related to murder etc and these are crimes in india as well so the former uh, prime minister sheikh hasina should be extradition uh, or the extradition should be performed and she should be uh, given back to the bangladesh okay now this was the question that what india will do so that is altogether different question we will be uh, you can say focusing on the what is extradition what are the you can say provisions with respect to that what are the principle which has been followed okay so let's start when we are talking about the extradition as a process so here you can say extradition is the process by which one state upon the request of another here we'll be you know understanding with the help of uh, example one state let's say that is india on the request of the another that is bangladesh okay affects the return of a person that is former prime minister sheikh hasina okay for trial of a crime which is punishable by law of the requesting state and the committed outside the state of refuse okay so basically state of refuse is india over here the crime has been committed in bangladesh okay and that is the thing whenever there is a crime which is committed in a particular state and a person has fled from there and uh, the uh, you can say state where the crime was committed they have requested the another state to return back the you can say that particular person who is the culprit over here or who is the accused over here for the fair trial that process is called extradition okay so that is about extradition now here you can say extraditable person includes those charged with a crime but not yet tried okay so that is the one class wherein you are charged with the crime but you are not tried tried second thing is those who has tried and convicted but who have escaped the custody okay the trial has taken place conviction has been there there was a sentence which was given but he has escaped from the custody okay and those convicted in the absentia okay that means that a person who has been tried in the absence and the convicted in the absence that person is not you know uh, present in that particular country such person can also be the extradible person okay so i hope that is clear now moving to the you can say uh, laws in india when we are talking about so for uh, you can say a person to and from india if there is a process of extradition for that person same law will apply okay so here you can say in india extradition of fugitive criminals is governed under indian extradition act of 1962 here you can see it is for both extraditing person to india and from india okay if a person is to be extradited from india okay we are to return back a particular person to a particular country or we are demanding the return of a particular person from a different country okay for both cases this law here will be valid okay the basis of extradition could be a treaty between the two states okay when we are talking about india india has extradition treaties with more than 40 countries and extradition agreements with 11 countries okay when we are talking about uh, you can say bangladesh we have such treaty with bangladesh as well okay now moving to the principle on which these treaties or the process works that principles are the extradition applies only to such offenses which are mentioned in the treaty okay now these offenses should be mentioned in the treaty only for those offenses you can ask for the extradition okay so that is one thing second is it applies the principle of dual criminality dual criminality principle means that the crime which is committed or for which the extradition is demanded that crime should be a crime in both the countries that act should be a crime in both the countries let's say murder okay so murder is a crime in bangladesh 
as well as in India. So that is the principle of dual criminality. Okay. So that should be followed. Second thing is the requested country must satisfy that there is a prima facie case made against the offender. Okay. Now let's say if we are talking about this particular case, in this India should be satisfied that there is a prima facie case against the Sheikh Hasina. Okay. So that is there. Moving further, the extradition should be made only for the offenses for which the extradition was requested. Okay. So when you are requesting for the extradition, you will be mentioning that for this, 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 uh, you can say uh, act or the crime, we are, you know, uh, asking for the extradition. Now there should be a trial and that extradition should be for that offenses which are mentioned in the request. Okay. And other than that, if they are actually going for addition of the other charges, etc., that would not be valid. Now moving further, the accused must be provided a free trial. So that is the objective. Uh, extradition is done for the uh, object of the free trial. Okay, fair and free trial. So these are the principles which are followed uh, followed in the extradition. This becomes important for you. That is the principle of dual criminality. Okay. Now moving further. Now we'll be talking about the euthanasia in India. Recently there was a case wherein uh, you can say a guy of uh, nearly 30 years age, which is in coma. Okay, and the parents of this particular person has asked for the active euthanasia. They have said that since this person has been in the coma for like 11 years now. Okay, and uh, we are not seeing any hope other than that also we are, you can say financially drained. We don't have that capacity to go for the further, you can say treatment of such person. Now this person is in coma. There is no life support which is being used. He is just there in coma. Okay. So that is why if they are asking for the dignified death of this particular person, that means that you have to provide an agent or an external agent or you can say some kind of lethal drug to end the life. Okay. So that is active euthanasia. And in India, we don't have the, uh, you can say provisions or you can say we don't allow active euthanasia. Okay. So in this case also, Supreme Court said that, sorry, we cannot go for the active euthanasia. We sympathize with you, your concerns, but we cannot go for the active euthanasia because that is not permittable in India. Now, what is euthanasia? What is active euthanasia? What is passive euthanasia? We will try to understand. Okay. So now let's start. Euthanasia as a term, if we talk about that is basically somehow taking a life of a person for with the use of an external agent or you can say that is a death which is imposed that. Okay. So here you can see a practice of an individual deliberately ending their life to get relief from the incurable condition or pain. Here you can say deliberately ending their life. Okay. So that is an imposed death, you can say. That is one thing. Second thing is to get the relief from the incurable conditions and intolerable pain. When we talk about the incurable conditions, there are various, uh, you can say, conditions wherein you there is no cure available of that. Okay. And the, uh, here you can say intolerable pain. There are certain conditions like that. When we talk about the, you can say, uh, you know, conditions like cancers, etc. Uh, in such cases where we do not have a cure okay in such cases euthanasia is an option there are countries way which allowed active euthanasia there are countries which does not allow there are countries which allow passive and not active so that is there now talking about the active euthanasia this is the difference between active and the passive euthanasia when we talk about active that means that uh, there was the lethal drug or any kind of external agent which has been used on the body to make sure that that person actually dies okay so that is active euthanasia that person who is already in the pain to give a dignified death we actually use some kind of poison or a lethal drug or any kind of injection which ultimately lead to the death of a person that is your active euthanasia okay when we talk about the passive euthanasia that means that there is a person who is on some kind of life support and we are just withdrawing the life support so that he can go for the natural death okay so that is the difference between the active and passive euthanasia. In the active euthanasia, we are actually giving uh, some kind of drug or any kind of lethal injections, etc. because of which uh, there will be a death. And when we talk about the passive euthanasia, we are not giving any kind of agent. We are just withdrawing the life support so that that person will have the natural death. Okay. So here you can see an active intervention to end person's life with substances or external forces like by a lethal uh, injections. Then coming to the passive euthanasia, here you can see withdrawing essential life support or the treatment keeping a terminally ill person alive. Okay. So if there is a, you can say person who is on the life support or any kind of treatment which is keeping him alive. And if you are withdrawing that treatment of the life support, that is passive euthanasia. And in India, we allow passive euthanasia after 2018 
but we do not allow active euthanasia so please remember that okay now coming to the argument for and against so when we are talking about the argument for here you can say patient's freedom of choice a patient who does not want to bear certain kind of pain okay so in that case he can have the you can say his own choice the matter here is basically there are concept of living wills okay these living wills are there and if patient has made a choice so that should be respected then second is right to die with dignity okay so uh, article 21 we have article 21 that is right to life in supreme court some judgment it was said that right to life includes right to die with dignity okay so that is uh, you can say argument which is in favor of euthanasia third is more humane to end the suffering you can you know that there is a person who is in pain okay we are looking at it but we can't do anything because that is something which is incurable in such in such cases it is more humane to you know provide him a dignified death then moving further shortens the grief of patients loved ones obviously if a person is there who your loved one is there in the hospital then there are you know certain you can say uh, you can say it is kind of a torture emotionally financially otherwise also okay so that can be avoided with that it shortens the grief of a patient's loved ones okay now arguments against the euthanasia here you can see unaccept unacceptable because it is not moral and from the religious perspective also uh, we understand that life is given by god and god is the one should who should take the life so from the moral and the religious perspective it is not right to go for taking someone's life away that is by active or passive euthanasia okay Second is euthanasia cannot be properly regulated. Okay, when we are talking about the laws or the legal aspects, that cannot be properly regulated because how can you decide that this person will not come back to uh, you know normal routine? Okay, so we are just speculating that since he has been in coma for eleven years, he might be there in coma for the next uh, you know for whole life itself. Okay, there are chances that he might you know wake up after twelve years. Okay, so that is the condition that regulation cannot be done because these are on the speculations. Then moving further, guilt-ridden patients may feel bound to give consent. When we are talking about the euthanasia, the consent of the, you can say, guardian is required or the parent is required. The thing is, now they are under a grief or they are under the guilt that that person is suffering a lot. Okay. And in such cases, if you are giving this particular option, they, they, they might take a decision, uh, you know, out of guilt. Okay. So, that can be, uh, that can also be an issue. So, these are the argument for and against the euthanasia. Now, moving further, if we look at the uh, euthanasia's legal aspects over here, you can see there was this case uh, that is uh, uh, Srimati Gyan Kaur versus State of Punjab. In this particular judgment, 1994 Supreme Court has given a judgment. They have actually ruled, uh, you know, overruled the judgment of 1994 and they have said that the right to life, Article 21, did not include right to die. Okay. Now, right to die is different from the right to die with dignity. Okay. So, that difference must be understood. So, initially in 1996, this judgment, earlier in 1994, there was a judgment which said that, that uh, it includes the right to die with dignity. Okay. But here they have said that that does not include right to die. After that, there was this case in 2011, that is Aruna Shanba case. Okay. That Aruna Shanba case was a landmark judgment, you can say. And this was the time where Supreme Court has allowed the passive euthanasia. So, Supreme Court here allowed the passive euthanasia. Here you can see for the Aruna Shanbag and made a distinction between the active and the passive one. Okay. And allowed the latter in certain situations. So, basically here Supreme Court said that there are two types of euthanasia. One is active, one is passive which we have already seen. And here Supreme Court says that in certain conditions we can go for the passive euthanasia. And in this case Aruna Shanbag was given passive euthanasia. Okay. Then coming to the next one that is Common Cause versus Union of India 2018. Okay. So, here uh, in this particular judgment, here you can see that Supreme Court legalized the passive euthanasia, claiming it is contingent with the persons having a living will. Okay. Now, in this particular common cause case, they have come up with the idea of living will. Okay. Living will is nothing but a person in his conscious mind. He knows that there are certain conditions under which he might uh, have an incurable disease or somehow he will be in a vegetative state. In such, uh, you know, considering such speculations, if he has with full knowledge and the consent gone for the making a will wherein he has decided if the if and when such condition comes uh, i should be given a death okay so that is basically a living will here you can say if a person does not have a living will 
his or her family members can make a plea before the high court to seek the permission for passive euthanasia. Now, if you don't have a living will, then what will be the case? Then they can go to the high court and high court will decide on the matter. Okay. So, that is about the uh, legal aspects with respect to euthanasia. In the end, we'll be talking about the concept of living will. Here you can see the Supreme Court of India legalized the passive euthanasia in 2018, stating that uh, it was a matter of living will. Now, it's the living will here, as I told you, uh, according to judgment, an adult in his conscious mind is permitted to refuse medical treatment or voluntarily decide to not take medical treatment to embrace the death in natural way. So, basically, here is saying that if a person or an adult, uh, again, adult means that a person who is uh, not minor, okay. Now, an uh, adult with the conscious mind, okay, having, you know, uh, free will, he decides that he does not want to take a treatment or he refused to take any treatment and he embraced the natural death. In such cases, living will can be there, okay. And it also laid down guidelines for the living will made by the terminally ill patients who beforehand know about their chances of slipping into a permanent vegetative state. If a person knows that there are chances that I will, you know, slip into coma or any kind of permanent vegetative state, in such cases, he can go for the living will. The court specifically stated that the dignity in the process of dying is as much a part of right to life under Article 21. Again, in this, uh, uh, when we are talking about the concept of living uh, will, which has come in the common cause case, in that it was emphasized that right to life includes the right to life, uh, right to die with dignity. Okay, so that is there. To deprive any uh, individual of dignity towards the end of his life is depriving an individual of meaningful existence. Okay. That means that meaningful existence means that life, okay. Uh, life, if you don't have a purpose or if you don't understand life with the, you can say, what is the meaning of life. So, that means that that is not a worth living life, okay. So, here the court has recognized the fact that if you are denying a person, okay, uh, dignity in the end of his life, okay. So, that is uh, basically, now uh, you can say that, uh, uh, that is the question on uh, a question by the you know uh, system on the existence of that particular person okay so that is how we can say that uh, passive euthanasia is allowed in india living will concept is allowed in india uh, right to die with dignity is part of article 21 that is right to life okay so that is basically concept of living will concept of euthanasia now we can move further with the next and last topic that is basically uniform civil code okay now, Uniform Civil Code recently has been talked about by our Prime Minister from the uh, Red Fort in his Independence Day speech, okay. Now, when we talk about the India, there are various personal laws which are there and uh, when we are talking about the courts which are there, there are communal in nature, okay. There are various aspects of personal and the religious aspects are also included in that and that is why now we are at a position where government is talking about the Uniform Civil Code. You know that Uttarakhand, we have seen a Uniform Civil Code which has been, uh, you can say, implemented there. There was this exception uh, that is Goa. Goa always had a uniform civil code. So, uh, considering all these things, we'll be talking about the uniform civil code. So, let's see. A uniform civil code refers to a single law for the entire country applicable to all religious community in their personal matters such as marriage, divorce, inheritance and adoption. Okay. So, basically what they are saying is that when we are talking about the today's uh, condition, you know that we have, let's say, let's talk about any kind of personal matter, let's say a uh, maintenance, okay. So, with respect to maintenance, in CRPC, there is a section, that is section 125, okay. So, section 125 talks about the maintenance, okay, of a woman and uh, dependence, etc. But when we are talking about a Muslim woman's right to maintenance, that has been questioned various times in front of the court, that whether they have to follow the personal laws or they have to follow the section. Uh, 125 of the CRPC. Oh, that is the problem because there is a confusion whether we should follow this section uh, 125 of CRPC or their laws which are there when we are talking about the Muslim women's right uh, under divorce etc. So, there are also they have talked about the maintenance in a very limited uh, way. Okay. So, that is why it is uh, you know various times advocated that there should be uniform civil code in the country. Now, here you can say it is intended to replace the system of fragmented personal laws which currently governs the interpersonal relations and the related matters with different religious communities. When we talk about uh, Hindus, we have, you know, co uh, codified Hindu laws like when we are talking about Hindu Succession Act, okay. And other than that, also there are uh, Hindu Marriage Act is there. 
so these are the acts which are you know uh, there for different communities as well when we talk about muslims muslims have their different laws with respect to the marriage and divorce etc okay for the christian and the parsi communities we have different laws so we have different laws for the different communities which create a confusion sometimes with respect to the judicial you can say uh, decisions as well when we talk about uh, various uh, let's say triple talaq was there okay so that was there in the muslim community but then uh, with the interference of the supreme court that was removed because that was seemed to be the uh, you know uh, need of that particular time okay now coming to the next part here you can see uh, when we talk about the ucc our constitution talks about ucc that is uh, article 44 of the constitution that talks about the ucc that is uniform civil code you know that article 44 is the dpsp directive principle of state policy and we know that these are not judiciable in nature not justiciable in nature that means that you cannot directly go approach the court if that is uh, you can say not followed okay so that is given in the article 37 that these are not justiciable okay so that is uh, and that is because uh, we don't have that kind of resources to uh, implement every DS, uh, dpsp okay but the thing is the intention of the constitution's favor was that that uh, sometime in the future we will come up with the ucc and that is why it was placed in the article 44 of the dpsp okay so that is there now here you can say article 44 is one of the directive principle mentioned in the part 4 of the constitution which is talking about states shall endeavor to secure a uniform civil code for the citizens throughout the territory of india okay and here we have seen that that is not justiciable in nature okay now coming to the you know some personal laws here you can say personal laws uh, are the subject which are related to marriage divorce inheritance uh, maintenance etc okay and these are part of the concurrent list of the constitution now hindu personal laws here you can say that has been codified into four laws that is hindu marriage act hindu succession act hindu minority and uh, minority and the guardianship act and then hindu adoption and maintenance act okay and uh, the term hindu here that represents also the Sikhs, Jains and Buddhist. Now, these are the personal laws of Hindus uh, which are there, which has been codified. Here you can see there are certain Muslim laws like uh, Sariyat Application Act 1937, Dissolution of Muslim Act 1939, Muslim Human Protection of uh, Rights on uh, Marriage Act 9, 2019. These are the, you can say, acts which are followed in the personal matters when we are talking about the Muslim communities. Similarly, for the Christians, Zoroastrians and the Jews, also we have certain laws okay so here you can see that there are various laws where there are various different laws which are being used okay now coming to the uh, you, you can say positives and negatives when we talk about the need for uniform civil code so here you can say that that is ensuring equality before the law okay on the basis of religion there are certain personal laws which are there now that uh, uh, ensures that there is an unequal treatment okay so to remove that unequal treatment and to have a uniform treatment we can go for ucc second thing is alignment with the article 14 of the constitution that is talking about the right to equality okay consistency and fairness divergent personal laws are there because of which there might be a confusion which is there okay and addressing the gender equality inequality when we talk about the personal laws or the which are deriving their authority from the religious aspect now most of the time you will see that these personal laws are biased against women and that is why there is the issue of gender inequalities also so to ensure that we go for the gender equi equality we need to make sure that we go for the ucc these are certain uh, arguments which has been put uh, in favor of ucc now gender equi equality if we talk about legal reforms and the protection uh, with respect to the gender equality as i told you these laws are biased uh, you know uh, against a particular gender now coming to the criticism if we talk about so you know that we are talking about the right to equality but then also we have the right to uh, you can say freedom of religion okay article 25 of the constitution talks about that and there are various religious practices which will be impacted because of the you can say ucc then minority rights and the cultural preservation that you can say that we have article uh, 29 and 30 so that can be against that because there are various communities which are following per particular kind of customs and practices so there, can, there is a risk of erosion of unique practices and homogenization of the uh, you can say cultural diversity when we talk about the uniform civil code that word uniform itself is saying that we will go for the homogenization okay so that is a risk is there and then practical challenges are there implementation difficulties is there balancing the diverse needs of the country that is also there so that is certain issues with respect to the uniform civil code 
now you can come up with the conclusion of your own with respect to the uniform civil code we have you know discussed the positives as, as well as the negatives okay now last part that is basically related to a test there are four five questions which we will be discussing over here and you have to attempt this question and answer in the comment box okay so first question is before launching a forward prosecution against a public servant what additional step is necessary if sufficient evidence is found a direct trial in special court b sanction for investigations the sanction for prosecution prosecution and d uh, immediate arrest okay so these are there so you can uh, attempt this question and answer in the comment box now moving further question two which institution is primarily responsible for the lateral entry rec uh, recruitment in india upsc staff selection commission niti ayog ministry of home affairs okay moving further question number three the principle of double criminality or the dual criminality in extradition means the accused must face trial in both countries the act must be a crime in both the requesting and the uh, requested countries the accusation or the accused should be convict twice before the extradition the crime should invoke two different countries okay so that is question number three now question number four right to privacy is protested as an intrinsic part of right to life and personal liberty which of the following in the constitution of india correctly and appropriately implies the above statement article 40 and the provision under article under the 42nd amendment into the constitution then Article 17 and the directive principle of state policy under the part 4, Article 21 and the freedom guarant guaranteed under part 3, Article 24 and the provisions under 44th amendment to the constitution. So, you can attempt this question and answer in the comment box. Last question that is question number 5, which of the following best describe the provisions of the article 44? It mandates, it mandates the creation of uniform civil code, it guarantees the right to free speech it deals with the regulation of uh, religious practices it provides for the protection of minority rights okay so these are the question which you can attempt and answer in the comment box with that i would like to take your leave i'll see you in the next episode till then have a good day thank you and if you have not subscribed the channel please subscribe it bye for more informative content like share and subscribe and do not forget to press the bell icon to get the notifications.